Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three, four, five. Testing, one, two, three, four, five. Our speaker this evening is Mr. Stanley Carnow, foreign editor of the New Republic. Mr. Carnow is a graduate of Harvard, is then a student at the University of Paris, and since that time, he served as foreign correspondent for a number of publications, including Time Magazine, Saturday Evening Post, and the Washington Post. He's author of several books, also recipient of a number of awards, among them a citation from the Overseas Press Club in 1966 and the annual award for best newspaper interpretation of foreign affairs in 1968. In addition to his functions at the New Republic, he writes a weekly newspaper column on foreign affairs that is syndicated by the Des Moines Register and Tribune Syndicate. And as some of you I'm sure are aware, one of his columns appeared just this morning. He said there was nothing uh, he didn't have any extra plans that that happened, but anyway, one of his columns appeared this morning in the Register. Most recently, in February and in March, he's visited the Middle East, and his findings have been appearing in a series of articles in the New Republic in recent weeks. And of course, the assassination of King Faisal of Saudi Arabia today again points up the importance of the Middle East the um, uh, flux which is there and the situation never seems to stabilize. And although Mr. Carnow is willing to answer questions on any aspect of foreign policy, he's been in foreign, foreign editor for a number of years, I think it's most appropriate that tonight he's speaking to us on the subject of his impressions of the Middle East. May I present Mr. Stanley Carnow. Thank you, Mr. Wilkes. Uh, what, you ought to save your applause till later. You may not want to use it. Uh, this story of uh, the assassination of, of um, King Faisal, which I read at the airport in Chicago today, uh, reminds me of all the complications uh, involved in talking about the Middle East. I was at a journalism class. Uh, this afternoon, and uh, some of the students uh, who were doing something for the university radio uh, asked me to do an analysis of uh, commentary on what this meant, and I uh, said, uh, I think this will complicate the situation in the Middle East, you know, one of those awfully stupid remark to make, but I rushed back to the room and turned on a television set and listened to Marvin Kalb say the death a much better voice than mine, of course, saying that the death of Faisal will complicate the situation in the Middle East. <laughs> so it made me feel a little better. Uh, well, this is a, both a good day and a bad day to talk about the Middle East. It's a good day because uh, the Middle East is very much in the news. And maybe before we're finished this evening, uh, uh, we may come a little closer to understanding what's going on out there or uh, conversely, we may be totally confused. Uh, there are parts of the world in which I've worked in which uh, the phrase was applied, anybody who's not totally confused is just very badly informed. Uh, it's also a bad day to talk about the Middle East because, as you know from the substance of what you've been reading in the papers, uh, Secretary of State Kissinger's attempt to bring about a settlement between Israel and Egypt in the Sinai has failed. Uh, and it's hard to be optimistic, I think, about the step-by-step -step process. I think the step-by-step -step process is finished for the moment. And of course, as we mentioned, uh, uh, if I can repeat my brilliant remark, the, the assassination of Faisal must complicate the situation. Uh, in ways which I can speculate on, but honestly uh, can't, can't bring any uh, great illumination to. I'll return, uh, I'll return a little while to ex trying to explain uh, what happened, or what I think happened during the Kissinger shuttle uh, 
uh, during Secretary of State Kissinger's attempt uh, to reach a settlement with Sinai. And I'll also try to make some guesses about what's going to happen in the period ahead. But first, I'd like to uh, start out with the usual caveats and also make a few generalizations about the area and uh, in the hope that maybe uh, we can understand our limitations in trying to understand the area. Now, let me say at the beginning that I'm not an expert on the Middle East. Uh, by that, I mean I haven't spent a great number of years in the area. I've been there in the area on and off uh, since the 1950s, and I've just spent six weeks uh, traveling through the Middle East, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, uh, Syria, and Egypt. I think I must have drank three gallons of Turkish coffee and listened to dozens and dozens of people, uh, ranging from uh, the leaders of Israel, Prime Minister Rabin, uh, Defense Minister Peres, uh, the Foreign Minister Alon, uh, King Hussein of Jordan, and uh, many others down to Palestinian commandos, Cairo taxi cab drivers, uh, the lady who cleaned my shirts, and so forth. So these are mainly impressions, in a sense. I don't have any definitive answers, and I might add that I think that that possibly the people, the different peoples in the Middle East, uh, really don't have any definitive answers either. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a problem out there. Uh, the first generalization that I'd like to throw out is this, that we have a tendency, it seems, when we look at the Middle East, uh, look at it through television or through our newspapers, so to think that the area, to see this area as one divided rather simply between Israelis and Arabs. In fact, there's a television show going on, uh, public broadcasting, which is called just that, Arabs and Israelis. It's a rather good show, actually. It seems to me the title is somewhat wrong because the area is tremendously diversified. Uh, what I'm trying to say, and this will, I'm trying to set this stage in a way because it takes us up to the problems, the present problems, the diplomatic and political problems, that there is tremendous diversity within each country and there's tremendous diversity among the various countries. Let's take Israel, for example, to start with. It's a nation of uh, roughly three million people uh, most, of the, most of them Jews, there are some Arabs, uh, a few hundred thousand Arabs. But if you take the Jews of Israel, uh, you find a, a kind of crazy quilt of different peoples, even though they're all Jewish, even though uh, religiously and nationally they consider themselves to be Jewish. Uh, they are nonetheless different. Uh, you have, for example, uh, the the, the so-called pioneer generation of East European Jews who went originally to Israel and settled it, uh, people who were personified in, in Ben-Gurion, Golda Meir, and others, many of whom were socialists, many of whom invented or refined the kibbutz system, which was a, a kind of socialism. Uh, that older generation is beginning to fade away uh, but it did play an important role, and it has an important influence uh, in, in Israel. And you also have, now from Eastern Europe, a new group of Soviet Jews who are just beginning to make an impact. Uh, they've just arrived within recent years. Uh, they're having great difficulty. Uh, just anecdotally, uh, I'm, one of them is a man that I met in the Soviet Union four years ago, uh, who was at that time uh, pointed out to me, in fact brought to me by the Soviet authorities as a good example of a Soviet Jew who was not dissenting. Uh, and in the weekend I spent with him, uh, he uh, uh, told me at great length why there was not a problem for Jews in the Soviet Union. 
And then a couple of years later, I got a letter from him, and it was from Israel, so he's in, the is in Israel now, uh, uh, telling just the opposite story, of course. Uh, he, like others, uh, is an intellectual, he's a writer. A good many of the Soviet Jews have come in, besides a lot of the old people are uh, physicists, scientists of one sort or another. Uh, a lot of them are having problems adjusting. My friend, who's a writer, was sent down to the desert. He wrote me a pathetic letter uh, soon after he'd been in Israel, uh, in a sense saying, uh, get me out of here. Uh, they got me digging ditches. Uh, these Soviet Jews are beginning now to organize as a political force, as a, as a lobby, as a vested interest. Uh, there are, of course, the native-born Israelis, the so-called Sabras, uh, you know, who uh, don't fit the Jewish image of the fat boy who plays the violin and wears the glasses. Uh, these are, as you may have noticed, uh, uh, extraordinarily uh, outdoors, uh, uh, cowboy-looking characters. It's quite extraordinary to find uh, in among these people a kind of uh, quasi half Spartan, half Athenian. Uh, it's very, it's very. I don't know whether you'd find it here or not, but it's very. Uh, I haven't found much of it in the American academic community, but one finds a professor of political science who is a paratrooper at the same time and goes out and trains uh, on weekends and then goes back to uh, uh, doing his studies of political science during the week. Uh, there are also in Israel a good number of a large number, an increasing number, of so-called Oriental Jews. Uh, these are Jews from Morocco, uh, Yemen, Iraq, from the Arab countries. And they are also growing into a political force in a peculiar kind of way. They're growing into a political force at the grassroots level. There's a kind of Tammany Hall effect going on among the Oriental Jews. They're, they're taking over the municipalities. Uh, I think now uh, something like one-third of the mayors of Israel uh, are Oriental Jews. They have whole communities uh, of Moroccan Jews, for example. Uh, they have a lot of influence in the municipal councils. And then, of course, you have Orthodox Jews and secular Jews and right-wing and left-wing and so forth. They're all united in this determination to make the country survive. But they're not united in what sort of policy uh, should be followed to make the country survive. Uh, and so one gets a scene of enormous individualism, uh, enormous uh, fragmentation, if you want. Uh, I think it's best told by a story of the President of Israel visiting Washington some years ago when Lyndon Johnson was at the White House. And uh, Lyndon Johnson said to him, uh, I want you to know that I'm the president of 200 million Americans, to which the president of Israel responded, and I want you to know that I'm the president of two million presidents. Uh, there is uh, enormous political diversity, and this is something uh, that I'd like to get back to when I get into this story of the shuttle and the failure of, of the present negotiating effort. It is very, very difficult to govern that country. Uh, it is very difficult at the moment uh, for uh, one individual, uh, in particular, uh, Mr. Rabin, who is not a terribly strong leader, uh, to take a strong position on a particular issue, to follow a strong policy, because he's got so many forces working on him. Now, something uh, similar is true about the Arab countries. It's, to me, it's somewhat less visible uh, in going to an Arab country because the Arab countries that I visited don't, the, the political forces in the Arab countries don't come to the surface as easily as they, as, as visibly uh, as they do in Israel. Uh, in Israel, uh, everybody suffers from lageria. You can't turn people off. I mean, everyone wants to talk and they want to talk for hours, and everyone represents his own movement, and so forth. It's a little less, uh, in the Arab countries, it's, it's, uh, there's somewhat more restraint, although I must say there is a lot of conversation. Uh, conversation and interviews by heads of state 
uh, national industries of the Middle East. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of talk. But if you take, for example, uh, President Sadat of Egypt, he has to be concerned uh, about various factors in his society. He has to be concerned about the military establishment, let's say. He has to be concerned about the peasantry. He has to be concerned about the vast number of government employees. And the government, of course, is the largest employer in most of these countries. He has to be concerned about the effects of the economic situation uh, on, uh, on his own government, uh, the restraints and constraints that that puts on him. Uh, you would find the same thing true in Syria, uh, where President Assad uh, must think about his army officers. He is himself uh, an Air Force commander. Uh, he has to think about that officer caste that put him in power. Uh, and then we can get into all the refinements, because that officer caste is, I don't want to bore you with all the complications of it, but that officer caste is, uh, belongs to a minority sect uh, within the Muslim community. They're Alawis, which are a so-called heretical or uh, slightly unorthodox group, and therefore they're a little bit apart. It's as if the country were being run, let's say, uh, by Mormons, if you want, as if it were a, a Catholic country being run by Mormons. Uh, that's a, I picked that out of the air. But uh, uh, at any rate, he's got to be concerned about the Muslim majority and the orthodox, the, the Muslim orthodoxy. He's got to be concerned about uh, the Ba'ath Party uh, which was uh, the socialist party that ran Syria and from, uh, to which he pays kind of lip service. I mean, everyone belongs to the Ba'ath Party, uh, but it's a little bit at this stage like Mussolini and the Socialist Party, the Italian Socialist Party. In other words, he's taken over uh, the country and the party uh, has become more or less of a figurehead, although it's something that he can't disregard entirely because his rivals are uh, off in Iraq, in neighboring Iraq, where they're constantly plotting against him. Everybody's plotting against everybody else, of course, you know that. And uh, so he's got to bear all these, <clears throat> these things in mind. And adding to the, these complications <clears throat> is the problem of relations among the Arab states. In other words, a man not only has his internal problems to worry about, but he's got to be looking over his borders uh, to, his, uh, to other Arab countries. Uh, and what we call the Arab world, uh, which I think is more of a, a hope than a reality, uh, uh, is a very complicated, uh, diverse uh, part of the world. Uh, the late King Faisal, uh, who I think was, you might call, the Daddy Warbucks of the Middle East, uh, was a conservative, uh, uh, religious, extremely religious man who had very little common with Assad of Syria, who was nominally a socialist and secular. And there were times when they were disputing, and there were times when they'd make some sort of deal, uh, as they did in January, uh, when uh, they pasted over their differences, and uh, and Faisal came to went to uh, uh, to Damascus and allowed himself to be pray uh, be photographed praying with Assad, which of course was a, a fantastic and amazing, extraordinary uh, gesture, considering that uh, Faisal was the paragon of orthodoxy, and as I mentioned earlier, Assad was a, a kind of heretic. Uh, but they did that for a political purpose, uh, which was uh, to show their solidarity. In a way, it was a way of, of Faisal showing uh, the rest of the Arabs that he was exercising restraint on Assad. It was Assad's uh, way of saying, well, I got Mr. Moneybags here, and he's going to drop a half billion dollars in my lap. Uh, and the picture is a proof of it. And the money, of course, was proof of it, too. He did <laughs> leave a half million dollars. If I can digress for a moment, there was a peculiar little incident there. Uh, a man ran into the American embassy in Damascus, and he said, I need a visa immediately. Uh, and they said, uh, 
but it might take a couple of days to process your papers. He said, no, I have to have it right away. I have to take the plane Im immediately for New York. And they said, well, what's the great rush? He says, I have a check here for $500 million that I have to deposit in the Mor Morgan Guarantee Trust Company in New York. And if I don't take it immediately, it'll, be, it'll lose whatever, a million dollars a day in interest. Uh, I asked, I verified this story. It's absolutely true. Uh, and I asked the question of why they didn't telex to the bank in New York and say just transfer a half million dollars, a half billion dollars from the Saudi Arabian account to the uh, Syrian account because both countries have accounts in the same bank. Uh, but they said, uh, no, no, it is a, there's a ceremony at which Faisal hands the check over to Assad and, and it has to be an authentic ceremony. I said, well, why didn't you just, why don't you just get a blank piece of paper and do it? Or they could have the receipt from the, the piece of paper from the telex machine. No, it had to be proper and it was proper, and they probably lost about $3 million in interest uh, for the sake of their honesty. Uh, well, to go on, I could go on with all these differences among the countries. King Hussein of Jordan uh, really has little in common with Sadat. And neither, am, neither of them like uh, Mr. Arafat, the leader of the Palestine Liberation Organization. But again, just as there is Excuse me. Uh, a tendency for the Israelis to unify in the face of an outside threat, uh, whether it's a military threat or a diplomatic threat, uh, there is also uh, a tendency on the part of the Arab states, if not to unify exactly, but to keep looking at each other rather suspiciously. Uh, to try to hold others back from doing things, from going too far ahead in any di particular direction. So uh, I think this is terribly important that everybody in the area is operating with these internal and external constraints. And I have to add that these constraints go beyond the Middle East. And the Israelis have to bear in mind what effect their policies have in the United States uh, because America is the sole support of Israel. Uh, they could not survive without American support. Uh, the, Saudi, the Saudis, for example, are also sensitive uh, to what the United States is doing. Uh, we are beginning now to put in quite a bit of money into Saudi Arabia and a good number of men at arms. Also, the Saudis uh, Faisal was extremely anti-communist uh, and I think his successes probably will be uh, and therefore they are very concerned with maintaining an American presence in the area uh, as a bulwark against Soviet penetration. Now on the other hand uh, you have it, under the heading of looking beyond the area you have Syria relying very heavily on, on Soviet military aid uh, the Egyptians have in the past uh, built an army uh, on Soviet military assistance on and off. It's been one of those on and off and up and down situations uh, since uh, the middle of the 1950s. Uh, since uh, the 1973 war, there's been a cooling off uh, in the relationship between the Russians and the Egyptians, mainly because uh, Sadat has been going along with Kissinger's step-by-step -step approach, uh, which has made the Russians rather unhappy because they wanted to play the diplomatic game too. And uh, so there have been strains in their relationship. Sadat uh, is a man who tries to keep as many actors in the arena as possible. Uh, so uh, as his relationship with the Soviet Union uh, begins to erode. Uh, you may have noticed he goes off to France and buys a billion and a half dollars worth of weapons in France with the Saudis paying the bill, incidentally. Uh, he sends somebody over to Libya to talk to Gaddafi, who's much more radical, who is much more radical than he is. He plays a little bit with Jordan. 
Uh, he plays with the United States. He plays with other countries of Western Europe and so forth. He sees safety in numbers. Uh, and so he has to keep in mind, too, along with everybody else, what's going on outside the area. Uh, so you have uh, this enormously complex picture. Uh, and I keep coming back and saying it's complex uh, because I can go on into finer and finer detail about it, but even though I, I uh, can't go on forever uh, into uh, all the most esoteric details. But this is the kind of area we have, and I, I can, uh, must say that we can only sympathize with those who, uh, who try to uh, bring diplomacy to this area. Now this, in the case of Israel and Egypt, these internal and external pressures uh, were very important in the breakdown of the Kissinger step-by-step -step approach in, the, in bringing to an end uh, or, or in the failure of the last shuttle. And I don't want to go into all the details, but just try to uh, sort of lay out the scenario, uh, the, uh, the action, the narrative that went on since last December. As you know, uh, there, was a, there were two disengagements last year, a disengagement with the, between the Israelis and the Egyptians in the Sinai, and something of a disengagement in May with the Syrians, with the Israelis pulling back from the town of Kenitra. Uh, OK, we reach the end of the year. In a sense, nothing has happened uh, during 1974 since those disengagements. Uh, a lot of explanations for that. One of them, uh, which you like, people like to give you in Washington, is that we had Watergate. Uh, and Kissinger was preoccupied with Watergate. Uh, at any rate, uh, 74 was largely a lost year. By the end of 1974, the Egyptians, who seemed to be getting nowhere, uh, uh, decided that they're going to, uh, their relationship, incidentally, with the Soviet Union, as I mentioned earlier, uh, was kind of in a deadlock. And they decided the time had come to begin to resume a relationship with the Soviet Union without, at the same time, scrapping their uh, relationship with Kissinger. So there was a plan on to have uh, Mr. Brezhnev, the Soviet Secretary, uh, Communist Party Secretary General, come to Cairo on January 15th. Well, as you know, uh, whenever a top Soviet is going to go into an area, uh, this produces all kinds of alarms and excursions in Washington. And there was a tremendous uh, need on Kissinger's part to get something going in the Middle East. So he, cooled, he called over, he invited, I'm sorry, he invited uh, the Israeli foreign minister uh, to uh, visit Washington with some kind of a plan for uh, dealing with the Egyptians. And the Israelis came along with a very detailed uh, plan uh, what they called a non-belligerency pact, either de facto or de jure. Either uh, they wanted the Egyptians to sign this formally or at least uh, carry out the steps in the, in the program, such things as, as uh, ending the Arab boycott and trade, uh, opening up uh, uh, airline, uh, airlines movements between Egypt and Israel, allowing Israeli navigation in the canal, and so on and so forth. Uh, also, renewing uh, for a long period the UN force that operates along the uh, east bank of the canal and separates the uh, Israeli from the Egyptian forces. In exchange for this, uh, the Israelis would give up territory in the Sinai. This is territory that they conquered in 1967. Now, uh, in the Israeli mind was uh, the more of these items in the laundry list that we get from Egypt, the more territory we'll give up. Uh, so they presented that. And one of the reasons why this whole thing was done uh, was to uh, impress Sadat uh, with the seriousness 
of Israel's intention to negotiate so that he would not make a deal with Brezhnev when Brezhnev came to Cairo. Well, Brezhnev canceled this trip for somewhat other reasons, I think. We don't know exactly why, but one of the reasons we think is that uh, when the Russians were negotiating with the Egyptians uh, prior to Brezhnev's trip, as you know, in all these diplomatic trips, all the negotiations are done beforehand, generally, if you want the trip to be successful, you prearrange everything so that the, uh, uh, the leader of the country doesn't go and the whole thing's a flop. Uh, so there were negotiations beforehand, and one of the items in which the Egyptians and the Russians could not agree was over the question of sending technicians along with weapons. In other words, the Russians said, we'll give you weapons, we'll resume our shipments of weapons, but we have to send along technicians with those weapons. One of the reasons being is the Russians wanted to keep a control over the weapons for fear that the Egyptians would touch off another war and they'd be dragged along in it as in fact they were in 1973 and have been in cases past. Well, they got into a dispute about that. Uh, Sadat would not have the technicians. He wanted the weapons for himself. And the visit was canceled. I think that was probably the main reason. At that point, uh, seeing that the Russians were set back somewhat in Egypt, Kissinger wanted to accelerate the negotiations uh, between Israel uh, and Egypt uh, in order to keep the momentum going for fear that if they didn't do it, uh, something would break down, the Egyptians might accept, uh, a, make a compromise with the Russians again. And so, uh, to, to, to jump ahead, uh, Kissinger went out in February to explore uh, the possibilities of a deal in the Sinai. Now, when I was out there during this period, it seemed to me that uh, there was a possibility of a deal on the Sinai. In exchange for which, the, original, the Israelis originally wanted the Egyptians to give them a pledge of non-belligerency. You might say a pledge of peace. The Egyptians could not do that for a reason I touched on earlier. They couldn't go further uh, with the Israelis than other Arab states wanted them to go. In other words, Sadat could not go as far as to give a direct pledge to Israel because that would have meant, in a sense, recognition of the state of Israel. Uh, now this gets awfully esoteric because the, the Arabs claim that they have already recognized the state of Israel at the UN in something called Resolution 242, uh, which says that all states in the area should live in peace within secure and recognized boundaries. Uh, and the Arabs say that does constitute recognition of the state of Israel. But somehow or other, to make a direct statement saying, we pledge that we will not attack you, Israel, uh, sort of escalates this recognition. And Sadat felt that he couldn't do this. Uh, Israel insisted on it. And Israel insisted on it because, for a reason I touched on earlier, uh, Mr. Rabin, is terribly weak. Uh, he, he, has, he governs with a coalition government. Uh, he can only govern uh, with the assistance of seven or eight members of a religious party, which is uh, rather conservative on foreign affairs, although domestically it's not that conservative. Uh, he's also feeling, he also feels the hot breath of his Defense Minister, Mr. Perez, uh, who got uh, about 40 or 42 percent of the votes when they were both rivals to become Prime Minister. Uh, 
He feels the opposition of the right-wing party called the Likud. And therefore, he felt that if he made a concession uh, without getting this pledge in return, uh, he would be in trouble at home. And I think basically uh, this is what happened uh, when this shuttle went around and around. Uh, Kissinger went back and forth. Uh, Sadat, I think they reached, uh, from what I know, they reached the point at which Sadat said, okay, I can't give the pledge of peace directly to Israel, but I'll give it to the United States. I will write a letter to the United States saying that I pledge that I will not attack Israel. The Israelis say, said, but a letter to the United States is not of no value to us, A, because it doesn't recognize us, and B, uh, what if he violates that letter? What is the United States going to do? Uh, the Israelis were particularly, in the last few weeks, uh, I think influenced by such events, although Mr. Rabin denied it, I think they were influenced by Vietnam uh, and what they saw as the American withdrawal or pullout from Vietnam and Cambodia. And this raises the questions in their mind, well, uh, after losing 50,000 men and spending uh, whatever we spent, $150 billion in Vietnam, uh, they're dropping it all. They're dropping Indochina. Uh, what good is a pledge? What kind of guarantee is that for us? Uh, they also saw uh, a rapprochement between Iran and Iraq, uh, which in Middle East terms is rather important because uh, one of the arrangements was that if the Israelis gave up their oil field, they would be given oil, uh, substitute oil by Iran. Now they see Iran making a deal with Iraq, which is a very uh, left-wing uh, Arab country, and this began to worry them. It began to worry them that uh, they would not, uh, they couldn't count on the Shah of Iran for oil because he was moving closer to the Arabs. I personally, if I can just offer a judgment, I, I personally think that the Israelis probably should have taken the risk of coming to terms with Sadat, even with this uh, even though uh, the guarantee from the United States is an unsatisfactory one and a, and a shaky one. And the main reason is because I think if they had come to a settlement, uh, it would have improved their chances of dealing with Syria. It would have isolated, if you want, it would have isolated the Egyptians from the Syrians instead of pushing them all together, which is what's happened now. I mean, think, what we're going to see now, I think, I don't, I don't think war is going to break out tomorrow, although it may happen a few months from now. Uh, I think what we'll see now is a move to Geneva, a Geneva meeting which started at the end of 1973 and then broke down, uh, is still sort of hangs there, and it's a, it's a, it's a venue, it's a place to go to. And I think what will happen is everybody will move now to Geneva. I don't. It's very hard to see what's going to happen there. Uh, the Russians will take part in Geneva. And although I don't think the Russians are necessarily trying to pour fuel on the flames of, of the Middle East, uh, they're not going to be easy to deal with, uh, at least for the opening uh, months. Uh, we'll see the Syrians and the Egyptians, uh, and perhaps others. I'm not, it's not clear what the, what the Palestinian, whether the Palestinians will come or not. Uh, whether they'll come by themselves or whether they'll come as part of another delegation. But anyway, we're going to see a very, uh, a kind of a maelstrom for a while at Geneva. Uh, one can say that it buys time, uh, and any, any, as long as they're not shooting, you're, you're ahead of the game in the Middle East. Uh, but uh, for, it may be buying time for an explosion that could be worse afterwards. And one element in that that uh, that I think is rather scary is the possibility uh, that during this time period uh, the Israelis might be developing nuclear weapons. Uh, maybe not for the next round, uh, but for the round after that. There's no question about their capacity to develop nuclear weapons, and there is, are, in fact, some people think they have them already. Uh, and since every challenge has a response, uh, you might see nuclear weapons going to the other side from the Russians uh, or through some other uh, third country. Uh, so I think the, the prospect ahead uh, is going to be Geneva. 
The Syrians, as I say, welcomed this. Uh, the Syrians were quite happy uh, that the Sinai negotiations broke down because now uh, it cuts off the possibility, for the moment anyway, of a partial settlement between Egypt and the Israelis that leaves them out in the cold. And now they go with the group and they have the leverage of the other Arabs as they try to negotiate over the Golan Heights, uh, which is a much more complicated area to negotiate uh, than the Sinai because it's so small uh, and you really can't, it's very hard to slice, it's, it's uh, very hard to slice up pieces of the Golan uh, satisfactorily. Uh, the, the Sinai is an enormous area and you give away hundreds of miles, 100, 100 miles of desert without it making a real difference. Uh, the Israelis consider the Golan to be very important for their security uh, because it's only about 15 miles across at its widest point. And the ridge of it looks down on one of the fertile, most fertile valleys of Israel, which is the Hula Valley. Uh, and they feel that they can't, uh, they can't make concessions on that area. The Syrians, for their part, insist that the area is theirs. It's a question of national pride, which is very important. And how you slice it up is extremely difficult, especially since the Israelis have been putting settlements onto the area, and moving those settlements is rather difficult for a reason I, I mentioned earlier, is that every one of those settlements uh, is backed up by some political movement in Jerusalem, and so if you start moving them around, you get all kinds of political screaming uh, back in the capital, uh, and that complicates the government's existence. Now, the Palestinians, uh, I think, the PLO, the Palestinian, Li Palestinian Liberation Organization, uh, I think is also, judging from the newspapers, quite pleased that the step-by-step -step approach has broken down because they too feared uh, that they would be left out in any kind of uh, partial settlement. Uh, there was, just as one approached the possibility of a settlement, even when I was in Cairo a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was a good deal of, of verbal uh, uh, criticism going back and forth between Palestinians and Egyptians uh, with the Palestinians warning against, uh, the, warning the Egyptians against making a partial settlement, the Egyptians telling the Palestinians to keep their noses out of it. Uh, and I think that there would have been uh, some problems with the Palestinians had they been cut out. Now I think, and this is my own, my own reading of the, Palestinian, the Palestine Liberation Organization, uh, it has been, it has made enormous diplomatic progress within the past year. As you know, it was, uh, sanctified at the Arab summit meeting at Rabat in September and called the uh, sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. Uh, Mr. Arafat went to the UN, uh, was invited to speak at the UN. <clears throat> it has opened offices in various countries and so forth. But I think it's a movement in trouble because uh, it has not, in other words, the gap between its, its diplomatic success and its real achievement on the ground is getting wider and wider. That is, you don't, just because you go to the UN, just because you have an office in Tokyo or an office in New Delhi, uh, just because you have diplomatic respectability uh, doesn't give you uh, any more territory on the ground, and it seems to me that is by its territory, I mean it doesn't bring you any closer to having a state, which is what the Palestinians want. Uh, and it seems to me uh, that the chances for the Palestinians to have a state within the foreseeable future are fairly remote since the two countries that are most concerned with the Palestinian problem uh, are Israel and Jordan, uh, both of which are hostile to the idea of a state between them, uh, West Bank State, uh, under the PLO. Now, it seems to me that as this, as time goes on, 
and the prospects for the, Palest for the PLO uh, of actually getting territory uh, remain remote, it seems to me this causes frustrations uh, and uh, doubts and so forth within the PLO. And it seems to me it doesn't destroy the PLO by any means. On the contrary, I think it tends, it would tend to radicalize the PLO. And I think we might see on the part of the, of the, of the Palestinian Liberation Organization a return to uh, much more, to a return to violence, hijackings, assassinations, the sort of thing uh, that we saw in recent years and has been calmed down as they were making diplomatic progress. Now the interesting thing about this is that it, it seems to me, and here I'm just speculating on the basis of what I observed and the people I talked to, especially among the PLO people themselves, that the real targets of this radicalization uh, are not so much the Israelis, because the Israelis are terribly strong militarily, uh, but it seems to me that the real targets could be the conservative uh, Arab states. I mean, my first inclination when I read that Faisal had been assassinated was to think that it was done by a Palestinian. That didn't make any sense today because there was no reason today for a Palestinian to assassinate Faisal. But if Faisal had lived, uh, if there had been progress, diplomatic process, progress, and the, and the PLO had been left out of it, there might have been reason uh, for a radical Palestinian to assassinate Faisal six months from now, uh, as there might be if the diplomatic process gets going again, uh, uh, to take certain actions, uh, particularly in Arab states that are weak. Uh, Lebanon, for example, which is a very weak state in which there are great numbers of armed Palestinians, seems to me to be a vulnerable state. Uh, some of the states of the, of the Persian Gulf, uh, where there are large numbers of, of Palestinians. I think that, uh, in a way, I think the Israelis would almost welcome the radicalization of the PLO. That is to say, the real radicalization of the PLO. A, because they've been calling the PLO radical all the time. Uh, I mean, they, they have refused to see any gradations of moderation or radicalism, radicalism in the PLO. And this, in a sense, confirms their theory. Uh, another reason why I think they would welcome a radical PLO is because as the conservative Arab leaders in the area uh, sought to defend themselves against this radical PLO, they tacitly become allies of the Israelis against this, this movement, uh, which is, uh, in theory at least, uh, the spokesman for the, uh, the Palestinian people. My own view, again, here, I don't want to dwell too long on the Palestinian problem because it's one we can talk about all night. But it seems to me that, that the answer still has to be a problem of finding uh, a territory for the Palestinians. And here, and as I said earlier, since neither the Israelis uh, nor the Jordanians are prepared to deal, uh, really, with the PLO, I think a distinction has to be made between the PLO and the Palestinians. A question has to be asked, uh, do all Palestinians really support the PLO? We, haven't, we don't know. There hasn't been any election to prove it. Uh, I did discover it in traveling around the West Bank uh, that the Palestinians living in that area are rather pragmatic. If you say, would you like a, West, uh, would you like a PLO government? They say, okay, we'll take a PLO government. I mean, they're all against the Israelis, but if you say uh, uh, they'll take a PLO government, uh, well, what if you can't have a PLO government? How about being a part of Jordan? Okay, if we can't be, have a PLO government, we'll, we'll take, make a deal with Jordan. In other words, they're prepared to, to discuss all kinds of other possibilities. But I do think that the Palestinian issue, which is a crucial issue in the Middle East, uh, really has to be dealt with. And I think the Israelis, of course, have been terribly remiss over the years in not dealing with it. Well, <clears throat> at the moment, just to wind this up, the American role in the Middle East has been greatly reduced, weakened for the moment. Uh, and this means 
I think to a large extent the Israelis are going to have to uh, pursue their own foreign policy in a sense Henry Kissinger has been the foreign minister of Israel for the last couple of years. I think the Israelis have to be, uh, ought to be, uh, more imaginative in their uh, foreign policy than they have been. At the same time, it's hard for me to imagine that they will be uh, since uh, any leader that comes along, unless we see the return of the Messiah, is going to be operating uh, under all these internal uh, political pressures uh, that I described earlier. So there's a chance I, I, I wouldn't minimize the possibility of another war. Uh, as I say, not immediately. I think Geneva will be given a chance. Uh, that will take several months. Wars usually begin in September, don't they? On Sundays in September. Uh, I'm not making a prediction here. Uh, I think we could see uh, a resumption of the oil embargo, uh, which as we know doesn't affect us uh, that much directly, but does put tremendous strains on our relationship, uh, relations with Western Europe and Japan. Uh, we see a change situation, a changing situation in Europe uh, uh, when we no longer, when we, the United States, no longer uh, can count on Portugal uh, Greece, Turkey, uh, Italy is in a changing political situation. Uh, I hate to sound ap apocalyptic about it, um, but I will say that whenever I've been optimistic, I've been wrong. Uh, so I'll listen to your questions, and maybe you've got something better to offer. I don't, I'm not quite clear. I don't get your point, though. I, what was the question? Well, I verified it with, it was told to me by the, well, it was told to me in the American Embassy, and it was verified by a vice president of the Morgan Guarantee Trust Company. Huh? Where, Where what? Where? One in one in Damascus and the other in Beirut. Oh, Beirut. But not in one in Damascus and the other in Beirut. In the, in the well, I don't think it's pointless don't to argue about this. Uh, who got the visa and the check? 
Yeah, I, I talked about the officers coming from the Alawi cast. Well, I was saying that both officers are Alawis. Are Alawis. Yes, I know that. Yeah. Would you explain who he is? Maybe people don't know who he is. Well, I think, I think for the, for the, my American friends, they won't understand exactly how you are. But you are, you are good there, and you seem to know uh, very much about the Indian Another problem I think is the last question. You said that you sympathize with those who wanted to introduce diplomacy to the Arabs. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Well, I do, I do think that uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a feeling in Israel, certainly, that they could fight another war and maybe a war after that. At the same time, I mean, this is, I think, one of the reasons why uh, they felt they could take a chance with rejecting the Egyptian, the uh, Egyptian proposal as unsatisfactory because I think they feel they can win the next war and, and maybe a couple of wars after that. Uh, but at the same time that they feel that, I think they also recognize that, uh, and this I think is an important attitude that I sensed in Israel, and I, that's one of the reasons why I'm disappointed that it did not materialize in terms of a, of a compromise on the Sinai. At the same time, they realize that there's a limit to how many wars they can fight. You know, they can win every war but the last one and uh, that over a long period of time, that time doesn't, essentially doesn't work in their favor. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't know whether that's answering your question or not, but uh, uh, I think that uh, I, I sort of regret in a way that they didn't make the compromises necessary on the, uh, on the Sinai issue. That I was not what? Was not able to lead the territorial gains do not match the United gains. Now, uh, let's see if I can hold this paper because I don't see who you address in terms of trying to foresee and to try to deal up. Well, I think what's going to happen, I, here I'm not making a judgment, I think that, that uh, I think the PLO itself uh, runs the risk of being increasingly radicalized as it fails to make any headway uh, in, uh, in gaining any territory. Or uh, I think one of the possibilities is that if uh, the, Jordan, uh, the uh, Hussein scheme, the United Arab Kingdom plan is dusted off, uh, that they, the Israelis in Jordan uh, might be able to reach some sort of agreement on a status of the West Bank within a Jordanian federation, which would, in a sense, be an autonomous Palestinian state, if not an, ind if not an independent one. Go ahead. Well, I just don't think the United States is going to impose a PLO state on Jordan uh, on its two main uh, protégés in the area, namely Jordan and Israel. If, those, if Jordan and Israel won't have a PLO state, 
and I think you'll agree with me that they don't want a PLO state, because of, first because of Hussein's memory in 1970, and also because of Israel's uh, just a plain opposition to a PLO state, that the United States is not going to impose it. I mean, the United States couldn't even, in its critical period just the other day, the United States couldn't even force or put pressure on Israel to make the concessions that a lot of people think that Israel should have made. Well, I don't know who's making, putting, putting pressure on who, whatever it is. The fact of the matter is the United States is not going to, at least I can't imagine the United States forcing is both Israel and Jordan to accept the PLO state. Uh, at the moment, we know that, that Kissinger has just refused to see uh, Arafat at all uh, since the diplomatic successes. Now, they're, they're going to follow. Well, I'm, I'm just making an observation. You're making a judgment. I mean, I'm just merely telling you how I, you know, what the situation is. Maybe it's the wrong way. I mean, maybe it's wrong. Maybe Kissinger should see Arafat. But the fact is, he's not seeing him. The Israelis don't want to talk about it, and neither the Jordanians. Yeah. That's a tough judgment to make. I really, you know, it's, I, I already said that I think that the Israelis should have bent over and made more of a concession than the Egyptians. But that doesn't change, this, that doesn't change the fact that, that the differences, you can, as, as have been officially described, is ir irreconcilable. I mean, they really are. I mean, it's, I can understand why the, the Israelis rejected.